uh, tonight, I'm very excited to welcome Nathan Hill, celebrating the release of his new novel, Wellness. Following up on um, the best-selling and highly acclaimed debut novel, The Knicks, uh, this new story follows the marriage of Jack and Elizabeth, two decades in and struggling to renew their connection and intimacy amid the perils of modern technology and self-help crazes. It's a reimagining of the love story with a healthy, healthy dose of insight, irony, and heart. Uh, it's also just selected as April, Oprah's latest book club pick. So please join me in welcoming to PMP Nathan Hill. Thank you, Keith. Hi there. Thanks for coming. I, it's such a beautiful, beautiful day out today. I'm, a, I'm very aware that you could be like throwing a Frisbee or like playing with your dog in a park or something, and instead you're here. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Nathan. This is my new book. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd, I'd read to you from the first chapter. Because the first chapter is where this whole story came from. Uh, it's, a, it's a chapter I wrote actually about 20 years ago and then decided to repurpose for this book. So I thought I'd read the first chapter and then uh, talk a little bit about what the book's about and what where the book came from uh, and, uh, and then open it up for questions. I love questions. Uh, so if you have anything you'd like to know, I love having a conversation with the audience. So please feel free. Um, so. The first section is called, Come With. He lives alone on the fourth floor of an old brick building with no view of the sky. When he looks out his window, all he can see is her window, across the alley, an arm's length away, where she lives alone on the fourth floor of her own old building. They don't know each other's name. They have never spoken. It is winter in Chicago. Barely any light enters the narrow, narrow alley between them, and barely any rain either, or snow, or sleet, or fog, or that crackling wet January stuff the locals call wintry mix. The alley is dark and still and without weather. It seems to have no atmosphere at all, a hollow stitched into the city for the singular purpose of separating things from things, like outer space. She first appeared to him on Christmas Eve, He'd got to bed early that night, feeling horribly sorry for himself, the only soul in his whole raucous building with, no, with nowhere else to be, when a light snapped on across the alley, and a small, small warm glow replaced his window's usual yawning dark. He sat up, walked to the window, peeked out. There she was, a flurry of movement, arranging, unpacking, pulling small, vibrant dresses from large matching suitcases. Her window was so close to him, and she was so close to him, their apartment separated by the distance of a single ambitious jump, that he scooted back a few feet to more fully submerge himself in his darkness. He sat there on his heels and stared for a short while, until the staring felt improper and indecent and he contritely returned to bed. But he has, in the weeks since, come back to the theater of this window, and more often than he'd like to admit. He sometimes sits here, hidden, and for a few minutes at a time, he watches. To say that he finds her beautiful is too simple. Of course he finds her beautiful, objectively, classically, obviously beautiful. Even just the way she walks, with a kind of buoyancy, a cheerful, jaunty bounce, has him thoroughly charmed. She glides across the floor of her apartment in thick socks, occasionally doing an impromptu twirl, the skirt of her dress billowing briefly around her. In this drab and filthy place, she prefers dresses, bright flowered sundresses incongruous amid the grit of this neighborhood, the cold of this winter. She tucks her legs under them as she sits in her plush velvet armchair, a few candles glowing nearby, her face impassive and cool, holding a book in one hand, the other hand idly tracing the lip of a wine glass. He watches her touch that glass and wonders how a little fingertip can inspire such a large torment. Her apartment is decorated with postcards from places he assumes she's been, Paris, Venice, Barcelona, Rome, and frame posters of art he assumes she's seen in person, the Statue of David, the Pietà, the Last Supper, Guernica. Her tastes are manifold and intimidating. Meanwhile, he's never even seen an ocean. 
She reads inordinately at all hours, flicking on her yellow bedside lamp at two o'clock in the morning to page through large and unwieldy textbooks, biology, neurology, psychology, microeconomics, or various stage plays or collections of poetry or thick histories of wars and empires or scientific journals with inscrutable names and bland gray bindings. She listens to music he assumes is classical for the way her head sways to it. He strains to identify book jackets and album covers, then rushes to the public library the next day to read all the authors that rouse and unsleep her and listen to all the symphonies she seems to have on repeat. The Hoffner, the Eroica, the New World, the Unfinished, the Fantastique. He imagines that if they ever actually speak, he will drop some morsel of symphony fantastic knowledge and she will be impressed with him and fall in love. If they ever actually speak. She's exactly the kind of person, cultured, worldly, that he came to this frighteningly big city to find. The obvious flaw in the plan, he realizes now, is that a woman so cultured and worldly would never be interested in a guy as uncultured, as provincial, as backward and coarse, as him. Only once has he seen her entertain a guest, a man. She spent an appalling time in the bathroom before he arrived and tried on six dresses, finally picking the tightest one, a purple one. She pulled her hair back, put on makeup, washed it off, put it back on. She took two showers. She looked like a stranger. The man arrived with a six pack of beer and they spent what seemed like an awkward and humorless two hours together. Then he left with a handshake. He never came back. Afterward, she changed into a ratty old t-shirt and sat around all evening eating cold cereal in a fit of private sloth. She didn't cry, she just sat there. He watched her across their oxygenless alley, thinking that she was in this moment beautiful, though that word beautiful suddenly seemed too narrow to contain the situation. Beauty has both public and private faces, he thought, and it is difficult for one not to annul the other. He wrote her a note on the back of his Chicago postcard. You would never have to pretend with me. Then he threw it away and tried again. You would never have to be someone trying to be someone else. But he didn't send them. He never sends them. Sometimes her apartment is dark, and he goes about his night, his ordinary hermetic night, wondering where she might be. That's when she's watching him. She sits at her window in the darkness, and he cannot see her. She studies him, observes him, notes his stillness, his tranquility, the admirable way he sits cross-legged on his bed and persistently for hours just reads. He is always alone in there, his apartment, a desolate little box of unadorned white walls and a cinder block bookshelf and a futon condemned to the floor, is not a home that anticipates guests. Loneliness, it seems, holds him like a buttonhole. To say that she finds him handsome is too simple. Rather, she finds him handsome insofar as he seems unaware that he could be handsome. A dark goatee obscuring a delicate baby face, big sweaters disguising a waifish body. His hair, is, his hair is a few years past clean cut and now falls in oily ropes over his eyes and down to his chin. His fashions are fully apocalyptic. Threadbare black shirts and black combat boots and dark jeans in urgent need of patching. She's seen no evidence that he owns a single necktie. Sometimes he stands, stands in front of the mirror shirtless, ashen, disapproving. He is so small, short and anemic and skinny as an addict. He survives on cigarettes and the occasional meal, boxed and plastic wrapped and microwavable usually, or sometimes powdered and rehydrated into borderline edible things. Witnessing this makes her feel as she does while watching reckless pigeons alight on the L's deadly electrified lines. He needs vegetables in his life. Potassium and iron, fiber and fructose, dense chewy grains and colorful juices. All the elements and elixirs of good health. She wants to wrap a pineapple in ribbon. She'd send it with a note, a new fruit every week. Every week. It would say, don't do this to yourself. For almost a month she's watched as tattoos spread ivy-like across his back, now connecting in a riot of pattern and color that's migrating down his slender arms, and she thinks, I could live with that. In fact, there's something reassuring about an assertive tattoo, especially a tattoo that's visible even while wearing a collared work shirt. It speaks to a confidence of personality, she thinks, a person with the strength of his convictions, a person with convictions, contrary to her own everyday inner crisis and the question that's dogged her since moving to Chicago, who will I become? 
Or maybe more accurately, which of my many selves is the true one? The boy with the aggressive tattoo seems to provide a new way forward, an antidote to the anxiety of incoherence. He's an artist, that much is clear, for he can most often be found mixing paints and solvents, inks and dyes, plucking photo papers out of chemical baths, or leaning over a light box, inspecting film negatives through a small, round magnifier. She's amazed at how long he can look. He'll spend an hour comparing just two frames, staring at one, then the other, and then the first again, searching for the more perfect image. And when he's found it, he circles the frame with a red grease pencil. Every other negative is X'd out, and she applauds his decisiveness. When he chooses a picture, or a tattoo, or a certain bohemian lifestyle, he chooses devotedly. It is a quality that she, who cannot decide on even the simplest things, what to wear, what to study, where to live, whom to love, what to do with her life, both envies and covets. This boy has a mind calmed by high purpose. She feels like a bean jumping against its pod. He's exactly the kind of person, defiant, passionate, that she came to this remote city to find. The obvious flaw in the plan, she realizes now, is that a man so defiant and passionate would never be, as interested, never be interested in a girl as conventional, as conformist, as dull and bourgeois as her. Thus, they do not speak. And the winter nights pass slowly, glacially, the ice coating tree branches like barnacles. All season, it's the same. When his light is off, he is watching her. When her light is off, she is watching him. And on the night she isn't home, he sits there feeling dejected, desperate, maybe even a little pathetic. And he gazes upon her window and feels like time is zipping away, opportunities gone, feels like he is losing a race with a life he wishes he could lead. And on the nights he isn't home, she sits there feeling forsaken, feeling once again so bluntly dented by the world, and she examines his window like it's an aquarium, hoping to see some wonderful thing erupt from the gloom. And so here they are, lingering in the shadows. Outside, the snow falls plump and quiet. Inside, they are alone in their separate little studios, in their crumbling old buildings. Both their lights are off. They both watch for the other's return. They sit near their windows and wait. They stare across the alley, into dark apartments, and they don't know it, but they're staring at each other. Thank you. <laughs> so then it goes into chapter two, and we, we spend a little time with, with the, the guy. Chapter three, we spend a little time with her. And between chapter one and chapter two, in the actual my writing process of it, there was about a 15 year gap between those two chapters. I wrote, what I just read is a, a revised version of a short story that I wrote. It's something in my mid 20s, I think. I had just moved to New York City after graduate school and I was living in this tiny little apartment in Queens, in Astoria, Queens. And, uh, and I was, <laughs> my apartment had one window and it looked onto this brick wall of other windows, you know, on all these other apartments. It was like, you know, just a small courtyard between them. So there's all this life out the, outside the window. And I, I, was, I was not having a very good time of it at that moment. Like I, my, I, I just moved uh, from school and all of my stuff got stolen on moving day. And like I lost a computer where everything I'd written in grad school was taken and like and like all the backup CDs because there was no cloud back then uh, all the backup CDs also taken so like I was like really lonely and I was like looking for a new subject to write about and like feeling really bad and I just had this like image of like these two lonely people kind of t t get catching glimpses of each other across the alley and kind of slowly falling in love and I wrote that as a short story and kind of tossed it off and forgot about it for many years. I started working on another project and like 10 years later that became my first book, The Knicks. And like about like 2014-ish, uh, I started thinking about the story again. Um, I have this group of friends that I, I go on vacation with every summer. It st all started like right after grad school. We were all living in Massachusetts and we went to Provincetown for a week and had an amazing time and then the next year we're like let's do that again and we went to province and then just every year we would go on this beach vacation with the same group of friends um and eventually like the group of friends changed like babies came along and suddenly like provincetown didn't make much sense anymore we moved down the coast a little bit and you know but it was always the same people and, and the same uh and, and and always a beach vacation and in 2014 i noticed that like something had changed over the last couple of years and we were all in our 30s now and everybody was like talking about these like 
life hacks that they had like it was and like people it was like really important like people were like doing intermittent fasting or like hot yoga or they're like tracking their macros or counting their steps or like like one person was like scooping out the insides of bagels to like reduce their carb intake or like somebody was like making like spiralized pasta out of zucchini instead of using normal pasta and, and again to reduce their carb intake and like and like the way people were talking about it it was just like i felt like god we used to talk about books and now we're talking about this you know it kind of made, made me weird, weirdly angry and like i was doing it too i don't mean to you know don't mean to like make fun of my friends i was doing it too because i i feel like that was the that era where like every every listicle that came through my my news feed was about how i was living wrong you know and like i this is probably still happening but it was like you know the I don't know, like, you're not getting enough protein or like the things you're doing wrong in the shower or like, you know, you're sitting too long or whatever. And like, it was just like, it just felt like, gosh, like if we would be really healthy and happy if we could just live right. But my God, it's really hard to live right. You know, it's like the speed of light. You can approach it. You never can quite get there. Um, so anyway, so we spent the we spent the week talking about life hacks and I was just like, I don't know. I just felt like eight minutes ago, we were all really happy. And now we're like, we all feel like we need to improve. And then I was on the ferry uh, going from Provincetown back to Boston. And I don't know if you remember this story. In, two, in summer 2014, there was a doctor who had been treating the Ebola outbreak in uh, Liberia and he himself had caught Ebola and he was flown back to the States and he was being rushed via ambulance to a waiting hospital in Atlanta. And they had helicopters, like CNN helicopters were like following this guy's uh, ambulance. And like, I was watching this on the ferry back to Boston and like, it was on the TVs above us and everybody was riveted. We were all watching this thing and the people around me on the boat who keep in mind had just come from like this great pleasant vacation and should have been in a better mood than this. They were all saying, we shouldn't have let him back in the country. We should not have let him back. You know, it's too much, it's too dangerous for the rest of us, you know. Um, you know, sorry, but you gotta look out for number one. We're among the things I heard. I was kind of appalled by that, but but then I, I don't know, I, I got to thinking about, about my week of life hacks and everybody like trying to improve their health. And I got to thinking, well, here's here's somebody who's sick and like, we're just not going to help him. We're just we're just not going to do it. And it, it was like this like this increase in self care had met this decrease in like empathy, you know. And I got to thinking, well, I mean, if we've got a we've got a system where it doesn't feel like anybody else is going to take care of us, I guess we have to do the job ourselves. Maybe that's why we're all like so interested in these life hacks because like. I don't know about you, like the last time I went to the doctor, it was like I had to wait for an extra two hours in the waiting room and fill out paperwork and triplicate, even though I did it online. I saw the doctor for like eight minutes. She couldn't remember what she told me the last time. I got charged $200 that I had to fight my insurance company to pay. And that's like just normal. So like if like a, a health like guru tells you if you just, you know, have turmeric shots, you can avoid all of that bullshit. That makes sense to me, you know, like, so I'm just like, okay. And, but there just seemed to be a tension there that I was, I was interested in, um, uh, this kind of new phenomenon of like self-improvement, meeting this like more systemic problems of like, just not feeling like we're being taken care of anymore. Um, and, uh, and that was also the era, like 2014-ish, 2015-ish, where at least in my Facebook feed, people started to get weird. You know, you know, like, like <laughs> you probably had friends of yours too, maybe that you like just suddenly like people were posting like people that I thought were otherwise reasonable people and they started posting things on Facebook and I was just like, do you really believe that? And like, and it just felt like suddenly I was living in slightly and then more and more, you know, large, largely different fact universes from the people that I thought I knew. And, and, and so between that and like the weird health fads and it just felt like, I don't know, there are all these stories floating around that like some people believed in and some people didn't, but the people who believed that was their reality. And so I wanted to find a container for all of this stuff. Like my novels are usually just containers for things that, that, that are interesting and, and bothersome to me. And I remembered this, this chapter about these two people staring at each other from across the alley. And I looked back at it and I'm like, okay, when in my twenties, I thought these people were really romantic. And then suddenly much later, I was like, these people are stupid. <laughs> you know, like they're really naive, you know, like they're, they're, they're creating these fantasies about the other people and thinking that's love. And by then I had been happily married for many years and I had a better understanding of what like a real relationship requires. And I was like, this is it. This is the container. Like this is a love story that's full of fantasy and full of delusion. And maybe this is a nice kind of Trojan horse for a, a book about the stories that we believe in, about fantasy, about um, 
conspiracy about uh, you know how how the stories that we live by can shape our world so i went back to it you know 15 years after its composition and started writing it again and trying to decide like if these two people who fell in love with fantasies of the other with delusions about the other what would happen to them if they got married if they had kids if they grew up and and it, what would happen if like this fabulously romantic beginning ended up sort of constricting them later i got to thinking about like romeo and juliet you know like what if they didn't die at the end of the play like what if they moved away and had some kids and like juliet maybe didn't like parenthood that much and like jack had a dead end job and they like look back at like who they used to be and they're like we're fucking romeo and juliet what happened you know and like i thought that that would the story of the, that they told themselves would be constricting so that's who these people are so these two people are Jack and Elizabeth. Jack comes from the plains of Kansas, from the Flint Hills, uh, uh, which is an area of the country that uh, I, I kind of I went to high school near there, and uh, and I find it I find it quite beautiful. The the Flint Hills are the last large tract of tall grass prairie in America, um, and uh, the the tall grass used to extend all the way from almost Denver to Chicago and and from northern uh, uh, Texas up to Minnesota, but all of it was was plowed under for agriculture except the Flint Hills because of the rock in the ground where where the place gets its name. It, it, it couldn't be it couldn't be turned into agriculture and so it's rangeland. And so to this day you drive through the Flint Hills and it's just endless grass rolling plains forever. And it's I find it really, really beautiful. And I decided to put it in the book because I was writing this book during a lockdown when I felt really claustrophobic. And like that is the landscape in my life that I feel most associated with like freedom. So I put the Flint Hills, Jack comes from the Flint Hills and he, he, he grew up in a very kind of rural Midwestern uh, um, uh, area, kind of not so dissimilar to, to how I grew up. And he always dreamed about like becoming a guy who was in the arts in a big city somewhere, which is also not too dissimilar to what I what I wanted when I was his age. Um, and then my other character is Elizabeth, and she comes from this kind of old money family in Connecticut. Um, and they have both come to Chicago uh, to become orphans. They're all they're both running away from from families for different reasons, and they meet each other and kind of find a kindred spirit. And it's the underground rock rock scene in in Chicago in 1993, the era of like Liz Fair and Smashing Pumpkins and Urge Overkill all these bands that I, I loved back then. And, uh, and, 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 and it's this fabulous Romeo and Juliet moment. And then the, bo the book flash forwards about 20 years and life has happened. Um, they're, they've been married for a long time. They're, they are parents. Uh, they're a little lonely. They feel very overwhelmed. And they look back at those people they used to be. And they, they, it's kind of like, how are those people possibly us? And the rest of the book is sort of an excavation of, uh, of, of what brought them there, um, and also various hijinks as they try to kind of get back what, what they think they've lost. And along the way, there's all sorts of stuff that, uh, that, that I mean, the, the book is also about, you know, the placebo effect. It's about art history and the art of the plains. It's about photography. It is about polyamory it is it's there's a lot of stuff in here uh, and and usually what i like to do with 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 my books is like i feel like the the very first thing the very first idea for a novel is like did anybody ever play with that toy when they're a kid called slime you know what i'm talking about like it's like this green gelatinous kind of semi-fluid you know and like i feel like the first idea i have for a book is that slime it's like malformed and keeps seeping all over the place but i'm sort of kind of uncontrollably drawn to play with it and like i don't want to tell anybody about it because it's kind of embarrassing uh and then the more you play with slime the more it kind of like picks up the stuff of the world like little bits of dirt and like fuzz and like carpet lint and whatever kind of sticks to it occasionally and like with slime that makes it inert but with a book that's kind of the point at least for me like I have this idea and like, I'm like, you know, I start doing some research and, and it's like, oh, this, this can be part of the, this, this sticks to the slime. And like, you know, I listen to something on a podcast and like that sticks to the slime. And I read a book, something sticks to, and suddenly I've got this like thing that I can actually start kind of chipping away at. So that's kind of the process of writing this book was, was the, this first idea, a love story that's really about the, 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 the stories that we believe in. And, uh, and then a lot of stuff attached to the slime in the approximately seven years that it, that it took to, to, to write the book. I'd be happy to answer whatever questions that you have about, uh, about the book or uh, about, um, uh, about its composition or whatever else. Does anybody have a question? Can you tell us about some of the uh, conspiracy theories that you write about in the book? And is it easier to write about those topics 
as fiction than as uh, literal truth. Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I very intentionally wrote the, set this book in 2014, so I didn't have the sort of rhetorical baggage of a lot of the kind of modern, especially COVID era conspiracies. Um, I think at least among the people in my lives who, who in my life who, who have gone down certain rabbit holes, as soon as you bring up, you know, you start talking about COVID, like people's minds just shut, you know, cause, because people have, have, are, are, um, have made up their minds about, about, about those things. So I, 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 I said it in an earlier era, so maybe I could avoid some of that. So some of the conspiracies I'm writing about are, now look almost innocent in comparison. So like the Mayan apocalypse, remember that? And the 2012 Mayan calendar apocalypse, like things like that, fluoride in the drinking water, like 5G, maybe not, maybe 5G isn't in there, I can't remember now. Um, uh, and, and things like that, things that, oh, and, and, and Ebola. I mean, the interesting thing that happened when COVID in what, March 2020 first started taking off, all the conspiracies online, like doctors were saying, this is going to be serious, and the conspiracies online were, no, it's not. This is no big deal at all. In a, with Ebola in 2014, doctors were like, it's a deadly virus, but we don't think it's going to turn into a pandemic. And the and the conspiracies online were like, yes, it will. It definitely will. They're, everybody's going to die, you know. And it was like just, it was just, it was opposite, but like it was just contrarian. That's 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 just what it was. And so I talk about Ebola in there too. Um, and I, I feel like that that era, 2014, was almost this warm up for like what we saw later. Um, uh, and 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 myself and maybe a lot of other people didn't see didn't see it coming, you know. And so Jack, my main character, um, is trying to engage with his father who believes all this stuff. And there's this maybe 50, 60 page sequence late in the book. Um, where I'm dramatizing the kind of dissolution of this relationship between Jack and his older father, and I'm doing it sort of from the point of view of the algorithms that are making it happen, that are driving them apart. Um, because I had this experience where the more I would debate with people I knew on Facebook who believed in strange things, the more those strange things would populate my own feed. And I noticed that sometimes these friends Facebook would be showing me posts that they made three weeks ago that I missed at the time. And they were like, oh, but do you want to fight about this? You know, and I, and I realized that the algorithm didn't really care whether I was like losing friends because of this and like feeling really unhappy. They just, it just cared that I was there, you know. And so I wanted to understand that a little bit better. Um, and, and yeah, writing fiction, writing it as fiction gives me certain leeway to do that. But I still wanted to be responsible with it. So I, I did a lot of research for that section. Um, Facebook is very obviously hush hush about its algorithm, but it has patented all of them. Everything that it does, it it, it patents it, and so you you don't have access to the actual math, but you have access to like, patent applications are public, and so you can just read what Facebook's intending to do and why why each of these algorithms are necessary for its product. And I, I must have read hundreds of pages of like very very dull patent applications that filed by Facebook and other uh, big tech companies in order to kind of get a sense of the underlying math and understand why this stuff was happening. And a lot of that was really helpful and, and, and obviously appears in the book. So yeah, writing it as fiction helped me in that I could hopefully make it less rhetorically, what's the word, triggering, I guess, um, uh, by setting it in, in, in a past time that was, that, that, that wasn't, that's not so immediately right now controversial. Um, and, uh, and, and I could, um, kind of fly into both characters' heads so you can kind of see what's going on behind the keyboard, which is obviously something we can't do in real life either. So dealing with it fictionally was in some ways w w helpful, though I do recommend, as you all I'm sure know, some great journalism has come out about, about, uh, about what the social media platforms have been doing, and I urge everybody to read it. Yeah, the question is whether the two main characters are on opposite opinions of the theories, and and no, they're they're um, Jack is the only one kind of dealing with this. Um, Elizabeth, uh, Jack has sort of separated himself from his family, and he kind of doesn't want Elizabeth to know where he came from, and so he's having this private fight via Facebook with his father, and he has kind of cordoned his father off digitally, so his wife Elizabeth kind of doesn't even know it's happening. It's just very private. It's just on the platform. Hi. Hi. Uh, the Nix is my favorite book, and I'm wow. not finished this, but it's it's amazing. Uh, um, I have a process question for mm -hmm. you. Um, being pretty near the end and hearing the first chapter again was 
kind of mind blowing to me because so much of it is there mm -hmm. in that opening. Yeah. And so my question is, with something so complex in the way that it's structured, how far ahead are you planning? Like you sit down, yeah. you do your daily writing, but how far ahead are you able to get? If that makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah, that's a good. That's a really good question and a real like headache producer at the time. You know, um, I, 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 I wish I planned better or outlined better. Uh, but I, I like John Irving writes his last chapter first and then writes the rest of the novel to catch up with it. And I'm, I'm just not that genius level writer. I, 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 I did have a, a skeleton on on a skeleton of the story on the on a wall in my office so I, I covered a wall in my office with note cards and uh and every note card was like a scene and then underneath that note card uh was you know notes for that scene kind of emotional valences for that scene why that scene was important snips of dialogue if i if they came to me and i would kind of shove a pin through the whole pile and stick it up there and i kind of move it around until it, it made sense um but always like in the chair writing every morning like something will happen in the chair that's like way more surprising and interesting to me than anything i had up on the cork board and i'll always almost always go with that you know if i feel like if it's interesting and surprising to me in the moment it'll probably be interesting and surprising to a reader too and so that always necessitates taking the note cards down rearranging them and accommodating this new idea and i kind of like that like it maybe probably takes my books longer to write because of it but like i like the exploration quality of of writing and i feel like i find things in in the exploration that i i wouldn't have thought of um if i had just kind of plotted it out all at once so um so i i kind of kind of there's this conversation that's happening between the outline and the work in the chair and they're kind of speaking to each other until i get to the end of a draft and then i'm like oh, okay now i understand what's happening and then i can go back and pretend i was that smart the whole time and like revise like the first chapter so that if you read it after you've read the whole book, you will see a lot of stuff there, or even that, that, that the, the first whole fanfare, the first like 30 pages, you'll see a lot of stuff that I'm kind of planting. And of course, I didn't think of any of that the first time around. That's all like I finished the book and then went back and like started messing with it. You know, that, yeah. that's a relief. Yeah. <laughs> So this book generated a lot of feelings for me in no small part because I grew up in the Flint Hills. Did you? I did. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and I went to underground Chicago. <laughs> oh my God. This book is about you. <laughs> yes. It's kind of like you took my history and my characterizations, split them into different characters, and then presented an alter reality where I made different choices right. <laughs> to make me feel grateful I didn't make those choices. Oh, good. Well, here you are in DC living your best life. <laughs> I actually don't live in DC. Oh, okay. I drove in from work. I, I work for a nonprofit. I'm an okay. ecologist awesome. and entomologist, but I do Yes. Um, so yes, a lot of feelings uh -huh. from this book. Um, and I guess my question for you is not to spoil it because this is a challenge to have some dialogue and, and there's a fantastic arc that is so wonderfully crafted. Thank you. Um, how, what percentage of the narration is unreliable? Oh, wow. <laughs> what percentage of the narration is un uh so my i'm trying to i'm trying to answer that in a way that's not a spoiler so the 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 idea that i had for the book a long time ago was that i wanted i wanted you to feel for your character for my characters kind of I wanted you to get to know them the same way you get to know like the people in your actual lives, like your actual partners, which is that you get to know people forwards and backwards simultaneously. By that I mean you get to know them forwards by like hanging out with them, having a date, moving in, whatever, like living. You get to know them backwards at the same time when you hear old stories and like maybe you see where they grow up, you meet their parents, you meet the friends they had before you came along, and you kind of understand who this person was before they got to you, you know? And and through that you create this synthesis of who this person is. And and uh, and then the more intimate you get with someone, maybe the more secrets you are allowed to have, you know? And so I, I know, you know, friends of mine who, see, who, you know, were very close to me. I'm sure everybody has these people who are very close. And then one night they tell you something and they're like, you know what, this happened in my life. And you're like, oh my God, I had no idea. And it's not that they were lying up till then. It's just like you hadn't achieved that int intimacy with, that, with them. And we all have those things, you know, those things that we only tell 
a, a few people. And like these characters have those things, you know? And so I wanted the, the feeling of the book to be like, you, you keep, you, you, you're digging, you're digging, you're peeling away the layers and finally you get to the thing, you know? So it's not that I feel like they're unreliable. It's more like you haven't, you don't know them well enough for them to tell you yet. Is that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. If anybody's not been to the Flint Hills, I highly recommend it. I very, very highly recommend going to a place called, um, oh, what's the park? The Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. Yeah, outside of Cottonwood Falls, Kansas. Um, it is a protected tract, and I, I think it was the first, it was the first like national park that featured tall, the Tallgrass Prairie. Like it was just an ecosystem that the, 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 for, or the, uh, the, I don't know, the park system forgot about until this park. And so you can go and there's like, there are just bison wandering around, you know, and you have to like keep yourself like a football field distance away from the bison. And, uh, and like, you know, you, so you're walking and then you're like, oh, there's bison in my path and on the trail. So you just kind of walk around the bison and it is incredible. And, and, and kind of nobody knows about it. Every time I've been there, there's been, I've been like one of like four people at this park and it's, it's really special. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, hey, so my question is about, I noticed there's a recurring theme uh, in this book as well as your previous book, The Next, about um, mothers and sort of their relationship with their sons and mm -hmm. how it's sort of this distance or this sort of disconnect. Yeah. So I just wonder if you could just talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, obviously in my first book, the, the, the mother, Faye, just leaves the family. Um, and in this one, uh, there are, there's a, a mother character who, um, who has turned uh, kind of uh, punishing, you know, like she's, it's, it's uh, something happened, has happened in her life that is, has made her feel quite bitter towards her family. Um, and I always have to tell my actual mom that this is coming <laughs> because like, she's lovely. <laughs> and like, and, and I, I, you know, I have to be like, uh, it's, it's, um, I don't know. It, I explain to her how fiction works, which is you you take certain details from life, but then you really supercharge them. You can really amp them up, and like, and sometimes you need to for um, for for dramatic effect. So um, I don't know. I th I think I'm 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 interested in it because uh, you know I had this I had this uh, this this childhood where we moved around a lot, you know, place to place to place. I never had. Uh, like a friend for longer than two years because we would always move, you know, and uh, and so even though I was the one leaving, it felt like being sort of abandoned, and and so that emotional space is the space that I re really want to talk about is that that kind of loneliness when like you kind of don't feel really well taken care of, you know, and and uh, and 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 uh, and and the way I get there is to not write about moving a lot, but to write about these people who have who have. Um, kind of severed or strained relationship with their parents, you know? So it's like an emotional truth while not being the story truth, if that makes sense, you know? So my characters are feeling the same way I felt a lot, but for different reasons. So I can I can talk about that because usually it's it's funny. Maybe I'm a fiction writer because whenever I've tried to actual actually write about that childhood, it's quite boring on the page. It's not very good. I almost need the imaginative leap to make it dramatic and to make it emotional. Um, it's the same reason why I don't live in Chicago, but I set my books there because I have I've spent a lot of time there. I spend my summers there, but I've never actually been a Chicagoan. So like I the, I can't write about where I actually live because there's no mystery there. I kind of need some mystery some some gap that I, my imagination can fill so I'm, I'm mining a certain kind of emotional truth and the way I'm getting there is are these other vectors cool. yeah. Thank you. yeah hello hi I'm also from Kansas cheers a, all right a lot of us in one we're, room we're all here <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask about a specific chapter in the Knicks, specifically a very long sentence. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I talk, when I talk about the Knicks to people and how much I like it, I talk about how you have a chapter that is a sentence. Yes. And I was just wondering if you could kind of share how that came about. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, oh, where in Kansas? 
Uh, Lenexa, right outside of Kansas City. Outside of Kansas City. This book tour, they, I asked them to send me to Kansas. So I'm going to Kansas City. I'm going to Lawrence. I'm going to uh, Wichita. I'm stopping into the Flint Hills in Council, Council Grove uh, to, to a bookstore there to sign some books while I'm at it. So I'm, very, I'm really looking forward to being back. Um, yeah, that sentence in the Knicks. So there's a character in the Knicks. You never learn his real name, but his screen name. He plays a lot of online video games, and his screen name is Ponage. Uh, and you... Um, there's this one scene where he is, I mean, he is an addict level video game player and he's playing my fictional version of like a World of Warcraft massively multiplayer online game. And he's, he's one of those guys who's just playing it like 16, 18 hours a day and kind of can't stop. And so one day he decides, today, I think the, the chapter starts like, today was the day he was going to quit video games. And then the next sentence is the, his first excuse about why he can't possibly start today to quit video games and then it just keeps going excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse and uh yeah it's all one sentence it's like eight pages i think and it's all one sentence grammatically correct by the way <laughs> <laughs> uh and um that came about because i was i was writing this chapter and i was writing it as a list so i i i i, I it was just in first draft. I was just brainstorming all the reasons why he, he would tell himself he couldn't possibly stop playing video games. And like, I feel like I don't know. I don't know about you. I do this all the time, where I like, I, I'm like, tomorrow I'm going to be a better person. And then tomorrow comes, and I was like, oh no, I'm still the same terrible person I was yesterday. You know, like, and and he's going through that, where he's like, he he makes this plan, and then and then immediately cannot follow through with it. And so he does what a lot of us do is he rationalizes, it, he justifies it. And I was just writing, I was writing um, a list. I was just writing in list form, not even in sentence form, just a list. And I, re I read all of my first drafts to my wife. Uh, it's just this, this thing we, uh, she, she's, she's a very good barometer on if a joke is funny or not, you know? And, uh, and so I'm reading, I'm reading this in first draft form and she stops me and she's like, is this all one sentence? <laughs> And it wasn't, it was just a list with no punctuation, but it got me thinking like, oh my God, it should be one sentence. It really should be because like one sentence is like, think about how, I don't know, like it just keeps going and going and going and you never get to the end and like how monumental that feels. And that's exactly what my character's going through. Like he's like, it's just, it's too big. You know, he can't, it's crushing. So I was like, that's a perfect sort of, a container for his emotional journey right now. So I was like, yeah, no, I'm going to do that as one sentence and just like messed with it and messed with it until I, until it, it, it happened. But like there was, I had to break it down into lots of different parts and, and, and like work on them separately and then jigsaw it all together to make it work and make it be grammatically correct. The f copy editor hated it. <laughs> well, thank you. I loved yeah. it. I thought it was like so frenetic and yeah. captured a feeling that I often find doesn't make it to the page so thank really you like thank you so much and it's funny i always know who has uh, heard the audiobook but not read the book because somebody will say the chapter with one sentence and they're like what what are you talking about uh, if you don't see it you don't know any other questions yeah, sure. I'm cheating because I work here. No problem. But um, a, a couple quick questions. So you mentioned your copy editor. You have you how you create scenes. You have rich characters. Um, you play with style. Has there been anything that's been cut? A character, a scene, a style that mm. your editor was like, nice try, <laughs> that you just like wish you could bring back? Uh, no, actually, there's nothing that's been cut that I wish I, I, everything that was cut, I was like, thank God that's not out there anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, my editors have been very, very good at that. And, um, and, and yeah, uh, um, I mean, th there, there, there was a, there was like a long, a long subplot in this book where like Elizabeth was like having an affair with like a former drama teacher from her high school and and like I must have written 80 pages toward that and then eventually I was like this is terrible this is just this is it didn't have any spark at all and I just cut it all and just like decided to do something completely different I'm so happy I did that you know and because after writing that then I had a, a better idea about what what uh, what the character needed to go through like emotionally and I just had a better way to do it um, so yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I'm not at all precious about cutting things, which probably makes you laugh. Is like this dude writes 600 page page books. Of course he cuts stuff, but I really, I, 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 I like, I don't know. I cut probably four, three, 400 pages from the Knicks, and like, 
and like it that need that ob really really needed to go obviously and i'm really happy it's gone um but so i'm not precious about cutting stuff it's just i don't know everything just feels especially with this one it just really feels like it it all belongs i, I don't know what i would cut so yeah so one more question uh and then I'll open it up in case anyone else thought of one. Any um, literary forefathers uh, or authors, alive or dead, who you take inspiration from? Yeah, I. Well, I, mean, I mentioned John Irving. Uh, he was a big deal for me. You know, I was living in Iowa City for a long time, the young man who wanted to be a novelist, and like then I encountered John Irving writing stories about young men living in Iowa City who want to be novelists. I'm just like, oh my god, you know, <laughs> like. Um, and and uh, and also, I mean, his 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 novels like contain a whole life in a way that I I just you can't get that from any other experience. You know, a novel is is uh, it's, I, I just love those big, thick, you know, lifetime uh, uh, stories. Um, so John Irving was a big inspiration for me. Um, has anybody ever read the writer Donald Barthelme? Anybody know a few? Yeah, he's a, a kind of. A, uh, I guess I, I would just generically call him like an experimental writer of the 70s. But he was a, he's, he's written many, many books. But my favorite two are two collections of short stories. One's just called 60 Stories and one, one's called 40 Stories. And he writes these just absurdist, surreal, like funny uh, short stories where, where, you know, like there's one called The School where like, Things start dying in a school. It starts with a gerbil and the fish, and then it's like the the class puppy, and then the and then and then it starts getting and then like fathers and grandparents, and the kids start dying, and like and then suddenly at the end of the story, which is only like three pages long, the kids are like you know teach us about death, and then suddenly the kids are like philosophers, and they're like quoting Nietzsche, you know, and like and then at the end like a gerbil walks in and everybody cheers, and that's the end of the you know the story, and it's like silly and funny and like I, I remember encountering this in college and I in my entire like literary education up to that point I never once laughed reading a book that I had to read for an English class I laughed so hard at these at these these stories and I was like oh you can be funny you can do that that's allowed you know and so yeah, so and so here was, you know, here was Donald Barthelme being funny. Here was John Irving being funny, and that was a big deal to me. And then and then also the other one for me is is Virginia Woolf. Is uh like I I remember the first time I read Mrs. Dalloway and just being like this is this is it, you know. It's like she like simulates the drama of the mindscape like better than anybody I think I've ever read. And I I write most often in a very close third person and it's almost entirely because of her her impact on me. So, yeah. Anybody else? Thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. I'd be happy to sign some books if you want. Thank you. Books can be purchased from our lovely bookseller.